background. I've been growing gingers um, for several years. Uh, started probably when I was about 13 or so. Um, back then, the uh, world-class collection was probably like 40 different species. Um, things have changed a lot over the years. Now you can probably get online if you want to spend the money and order 200 or 300 different types. Um, but I've always you know, tried different plants and all, but I've sort of never gotten away from gingers entirely. It's always been my specialist, specialty. Um, but today we're going to kind of focus on mostly hardy gingers that will grow in the Mobile area. Um, we're actually the same uh, USDA hardiness zone. I live just south of Baton Rouge, it's uh, zone 8B. Um, there's a lot that we can grow, but the actual ginger family has over 2,000 species. And it's not counting uh, varieties and hybrids. Uh, and really, gingers is two different plant families now. It's uh, gingerbraceae, gingerbraceae, which is your true gingers, and then the spiral gingers, which is costas. Um, those, for the most part, are Central South America. We do have some varieties that we can grow here, but the majority of them are very tropical and not meant for a zone AB climate. Um, so we're going to kind of focus on the hardy gingers. Um, like there are too many slides of the tropical that everyone moves and eyes and then you tell them that you can't go here. It makes everyone mad. So um, I only have a few pictures of those. Um, we're going to start uh, just go sort of alphabetically. Uh, Altinia. Uh, Altinia are uh, often called shell gingers. Um, very large genus, well over 100 species, the majority of which we cannot grow here. Second problem, even the ones that are very cold hardy, most will not bloom without some freeze protection. Uh, they pretend, uh, they usually um, bloom on 16 month old stems and they kind of are in induced by the daylight um, hours. So they like to bloom in spring and if you live in the south and it freezes, they'll come up in spring but they're too young to bloom. So, this is a very cold hardy one, it's Alpena Fomosana. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, Beautiful flower, but mostly grown for the foliage. Um, for whatever reason, they're more variegated alpinias than any other group of gingers. This one has a very nice uh, pinstripe white leaf. Very cold hardy. You can actually take freezes down to about 28 degrees uh, without leaf damage. So on a mild winter, this one will bloom for us. Uh, but again, mostly a foliage plant. This is um, not fully open. This is Alpinia galanga. This is one to grow. It's an edible ginger. It's used a lot in Thai cooking. Um, Laos root or galangale. Very easy to grow. It is one of very few opinions that will bloom in this climate every year, no matter what. Um, mine have always grown back and will always bloom. We do have a few of these available. It gets about six feet tall. Uh, it's really nice, attractive foliage. These flowers, which are you know, dozens and dozens of flowers open up to small white with red striping. So it's a very nice look to it. When you say it's edible, how do you, what do you mean? The, root the, the, the rootstock is edible, the actual rhizome. Um, it's a lot tougher than like the edible ginger that you buy at the grocery store. It's a different type. Um, it does take a very sharp knife to cut, but it's usually uh, used in soups a lot, in Thai cooking. Um, they don't actually eat the rhizome, it's more of a flavoring. Okay, and how do you harvest it? Um, Usually, I kind of do it when they're um, at the end of the season, like in winter, but you can actually you harvest it out as growing. So you take it to the whole root. Right, right. So it's not coming back. Right, right. but you, you don't want to lay up your only plant and sacrifice it. You get a big clump going and you just dig up a piece up. Uh, they tend to use the, the newer um, sections of the rhizome that haven't really aged yet, so you don't want to go through winter and then dig it up where it's. it's uh, it's not the same flavor and all. It's not easier to cut to. The, the newer stems are a bit softer or newer rhizomes. So harvest it in this? As it's growing, once you have an established clump, whenever you want to use it, dig up uh, a new section of it. And it will be a piece of radical. Right. So some of the gingers is better to do it as they go dormant. You just harvest what you need for that you know, season, basically. This is Alpinia japonica. Um, it's a very uh, short growing, um, really attractive plant. It's, in the south, it should be used, like people try to use uh, cast iron plants, which is 
often one of the ugliest plants you can landscape with. <laughs> they, they put it in you know, the wrong environment and it gets burned ugly. This will make a very nice, low growing, like ring around trees, um, very soft, velvety leaf, and extremely cold hardy. Another one that will take mild freezes without pulling uh, dormant. Um, the next slide is one we do have today, which is a, a new variegated form. Uh, really stunning leaves. Um, in Japan, the only area is just native to um, the uh, nurseries there are very big into variegated plants. So they do a great job of preserving plants. One was released several years ago called Extra Spicy, which was nice like this, but it reverted to green very, very easily. So if you spent the money to buy a nice plant, you had to do a lot of work to take all the green stems off. Um, and uh, it's not really easily available anymore. This one came out of California. Uh, I just happened to look out and, and heard about it and, and got a few sent to me. Um, out of the 30 plants I've divided so far, I've not had a single one make a green stem. Um, they're all beautiful like this. It doesn't have like a cultivar name yet. But, um, beautiful plant. This is the one that most of you have probably seen, maybe not in bloom in this area, but this is the regular shell ginger grown all over the world. Um, great landscape plant, really attractive, with waxy, dark green leaves. Again, it will not bloom unless it stays up all winter long. Um, so in the south, once uh, in this area, it's really just for foliage. As you go further south, like in south Louisiana and then down in Florida, it will bloom every year, no problem. And in courtyards in the uh, New Orleans area where it's, it's sheltered, they usually can take enough cold, they don't get frozen back. And I just learned last year from the taxonomist working in this group, the one that we've all grown, that's grown around the world, is actually a natural hybrid. It's not pure Alpinius arumbid. Um, there's a variegated form, which landscapers in the south have loved for decades. It's everywhere. That's actually a pure species. So if you go somewhere in the tropics where both are growing, you'll often see seeds on the variegated one, if not on the green leaf type. And the reason why is that this one is a hybrid and it's sterile. And um, the variegated one actually will come true from seed, which most variegated plants don't. Because I've never bloomed these, I've never tried to do any hybrids, but I've been trying to plant that seed in people's head that, that have all these. If you hybridize onto that, you're going to get variegated hybrids, which is you know, really worth doing. But again, in the south, this is a great landscape plant. Uh, landscapers have used it for um, many, many years. Now, so we didn't show too many slides of plants you can't grow, but sometimes it's good <laughs> to warn people because this is one that I always get asked. And as people have been on vacation and insert either Hawaii or Jamaica, or Bahamas, any tropical area, they have this red ginger. Can I grow it here? And the answer is absolutely not. Please don't waste <laughs> your money. Um, beautiful plant. It's basically used like azaleas are here. Landscapes everywhere in the tropics um, hates cold weather. There are a few cultivars that can take you know, a little bit of cold, and cold being like 50 degrees. Our cold is a lot lower than 50 degrees. Um, not worth doing. So when you go to Hawaii and they sell them in little bags at the airport. <laughs> Buy some macadamia nuts instead, and would be uh, much better off. <laughs> Uh, Alpinia purpurata, uh, red ginger is the common name. There's a, a pink form, a couple of different pure white varieties. Um, again, it's a beautiful plant. It's a great cut flower. Um, it's, it's actually probably the most widely grown ginger, ornamental ginger in the world, just because of the commercial value of the, the cut flowers. Now we're getting out of Alpinias into a very small genus. This is called Cornucumferia. There are only three species. Um, this is a variety of Arantia, Arantiflora called uh, Jungle Gold. If you are not growing this, this is one to definitely have in the south. It's uh, been available for the last 15 years or so. It's uh, one of the absolute best shade plants um, you can grow in the south. If you try to grow hostas, and they uh, I'll fit some more people. Uh, hostas really don't belong in the south. It's more of a northern plant. We'll try to grow them here. And now there are some varieties that that do well, but it's, it's not the ideal climate for them. So the peacock gingers and then this one, which grows like a peacock ginger, are what we should be growing in the south. Um, 
you have more options than just green and, and variegated leaves also. But it's got this incredible pattern on it, a bright gold flower in the spring. It only grows about uh, six to eight inches tall, makes a nice mound, it spreads you know, slowly, it's not invasive at all, but it's a beautiful landscape plant. This is a flower. And this uh, was just published, it was about 10 years ago. It came into cultivation and was grown all over Australia and the U.S. before it ever got a name. Um, I had written a ginger book many years ago um, when I was less than 50. But, um, <laughs> when, when I wrote the book, it was supposed to be a Busenbergia, which we've since learned it's not. It's a brand new genus. Uh, it's called Cornu Kempferia. Kempferia are your peacock gingers. Um, and they basically say they're closely related. Well, the new genetic research people are doing into the, the family, this is actually more closely related to the edible ginger you buy at the supermarket than it is to the peacock gingers. Um, but it, it grows in the wild with the Kempferia. They the same habit and everything, but very um, distantly related. Okay. Uh, again, there's only three species of those, and uh, only one that's really in cultivation. We're going to move on to the costas, or the spiral gingers. It's a separate family from uh, the rest of the gingers. Um, the majority of the species are found in Central and South America. There are um, actually some in Africa, um, very distant populations, but uh, they actually will hybridize. So there's some interesting things coming out, like crossing from different parts of the world. But again, great plants, very easy to grow, but there are only a few species that are cold hardy and don't eat bee. This is the one that's Costas pictus, called hieroglyphics. Um, basically because of the stem, it's got a pattern on it. So once it gets mature, even when it's not in bloom, it's got a really nice feature. Very tall plant, it will get eight feet tall in this area. And once they mature, it will bloom from a separate spikes from the ground, and it'll also bloom on top of each stem. So it's you know, green cone with a pretty yellow and red flower. And, uh, there's also a, a red stem form which is available that's uh, called the insulin plant because when they basically eat the juice from the stem, it uh, has an insulin mimicking effect, which in some countries actually using it for diabetes treatment. How effective it is, I don't really know. Um, I wouldn't just eat a bunch and stuff it works. Uh, next. And this is, well. That is for that one? Yes. Um, if, it, if we can't grow here, I'll, I'll definitely mention it. Okay, you can go to the next one. Um, this is uh, what used to be called Costa speciosis. Um, it's, I'm, I think I have it labeled as Costa speciosis on here. Um, it's gone through several name changes in the last five years, and, and it's about to go through another one. <laughs> so we're just going to call it what it's always been called. Uh, it's called crepe ginger. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, gingers. I've had this from my very first days growing stuff. It's been through every bad weather issue we've had, every cold winter, um, everything that can be thrown at it. It's basically bulletproof. It's, uh, again, it blooms basically from late June all the way to the frost. What happens is it starts with this little bud in the stem and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Every day you have a nice big you know, great white flower. Um, it actually is a few gingers in our area that will, uh, is pollinated by local pollinators, so it makes lots of seeds, um, which birds like to eat and like to disperse throughout the yard. So you do have to kind of watch out for it. It's not really invasive, but uh, that was always great for me because I was propagating um, in my parents' house. My dad was hating this plant because the birds basically helped me out a lot. But it was ruining all his beds um, until I'd dig them up. And now that I live you know, down the road and I come to dig stuff up, and you know, he gets mad because I'm taking his plants. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think it's fair since he uh, cursed them for a long time. Uh, but again, this is one everyone should grow, very easy. Um, how tall is it here? Um, it varies depending on how old the clump is and, and where it is in your yard. It's uh, one of the, a really good ginger because you can grow it in bright shade to full sun. Very, you know, it's very easy to pick an area for it. It grows in like clay to really good, well-drained, rich soil. It's not very picky. But six feet, six to seven feet, um, it's about average. I do grow a dwarf variety that gets about three feet tops. Um, but yeah, just one of the best gingers you can grow. How long do the blooms last on that? Um, the, 
for most genders, the actual flower itself only lasts a day. But when you have a colored inflorescence like that, which is a nice red color, um, that lasts actually months. One stem will last two to three months. The whole clump will bloom even longer than that because you always have new stems coming up that are a little behind. So you have like a, a much longer uh, blooming period. But uh, yeah, you know, late June, basically to frost. Even when it's done blooming, you have a, a red cone that will last. It doesn't just dry out right away. And you can actually use them for cut flowers. And this is one I've recommended for people that, that want that red ginger they see in Hawaii. And it's not the same color, but it's very easy to grow and it lasts as a cut. So it's a good substitute. Um, this is uh, a relatively new one. Costas Pargasii, or raspberry yogurt is the trade name for it. Very elegant foliage. So, um, Kind of like a dark olive green with a little bit of silver in the leaf. The underside is uh, dark red. It's got a bright red cone, but it's actually been proven to be cold hardy in our area. Um, and it's another nice one. It's fairly new, not well known yet. Now, this is just a flower. Of, uh, a few of my slides are out of order. I apologize. This is Casus pictus, which you mentioned earlier. It's just a flower. Now, this is um, one of my hybrids. There are, I think, a few left, 10 or so. Um, everyone should have this plant. Uh, I actually hybridized this many years ago when I first uh, started trying to do hybrids. Um, I released a couple. It's not one of the ones I released. Um, when it first bloomed, it looked kind of like one of parents. It wasn't different enough to pursue it. Um, but I had lost mine. Fortunately, I had given some cuttings to a friend of mine in Hawaii that was a, a commercial grower. And years later, I saw on the sales list he had Costas hybrid Tim Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> I called him up and said, I know you didn't name anything after me, so what is this plant? And so that's one of the ones that yeah, I gave him. But I had to give him cuttings. I didn't know if they had taken or not, because I had like 10 different things. And it's like, I need that back. <laughs> so he sent me some back, but he said it's a very good cut flower. Um, those, the, one of the parents is what we call Costas Barbados, which is a beautiful red cone like this. Very cold hardy in our area, but will not bloom because it, it again wants to bloom in spring, but when it gets frozen back, it's it's too early. Um, it just won't ever bloom. The other parent, the mother plant, is not hardy at all, but it's a very good grower, blooms nonstop, and this hybrid has the best of everything. Um, you can't really tell from the photo, but it's a fiery red, it's an orange highlight, it's really bright. Once it starts blooming, it'll bloom all season long. It's cold hardy. It gets about, for us, it three or four feet. Um, this was actually taken in Panama. So I brought some to a friend there. Came back several years later, and then, you know, I was like, wow, this is a really nice hybrid. <laughs> um, it's called Phoenix. And it's called Phoenix because basically the, the color, and also it did come back from the ashes because I thought it was long gone. Uh, came back to life. Now it's uh, cut flower growers in Hawaii and, and South America, Central America, and Asia have this. And, Australia, and so it's spread around. There's actually more plants outside of the U.S. than there are in the U.S., um, but it's a, it's a great hybrid. And now we're getting on to one of my favorite groups. These are curcumas. Um, the, most, the two most well-known types we have are turmeric, which if you're into Indian cooking at all, is um, a spice plant. They use the rhizomes. It can be like a, a solid yellow to a bright orange coloring, depending on the variety. And the other one, which many of you know, is called hidden ginger, which grows like a weed, and it's probably one of the, the least attractive of the genus, but it's very easy to grow, and it's been handed down for generations. It's been in the U.S. for decades and decades. Um, but the hidden ginger name is really kind of bad for the group, because most of them aren't hidden like that. A lot of them bloom like this one, this is curcuma elata. They bloom from the ground in spring before there's any foliage. So all of a sudden you have like this massive color. Um, this is another one, Ornata. Um, you have some that have the blooms held above the foliage, so very visible, you know, great display. So most of them aren't hidden at all. But these are very easy plants to grow. This is again curcuma ornata. I believe there's some at the garden set in the sale area as well. If you want to use it for cooking, the same way you're talking about the other one? Um, yes, the only thing is, the, again, with most gingers, the ones that are edible are usually like the least attractive in that group. Um, these, 
um, give you a little background on the curcumas, there's basically two types of curcuma. You have the true wild species that are very diverse, um, really small rhizomes sometimes, every color imaginable, different foliage types. And then you have um, what are called polyploids, which are these medicinal edible varieties that are basically hybrids that were developed naturally over the years. And because they're medicinal and edible, they've been cultivated for hundreds, if not thousands of years in India and China. Um, they don't make seed, and they're basically, there's only two or three parents that made all these different hybrids. Now, they've all been published over the years as species. Um, the problem is, if you look, the flowers and all of this group look identical. So there's really no easy way to tell them apart. Even the taxonomists that have tried to work on these, most, most of the time give up after a year or two. Because they come in like, I'm going like, to figure all this out, and then they're like, I'm not going to have it again. <laughs> there is one woman now that's working on them who's very thorough, very good, is taking her time and doing things the right way and trying to figure some out. But not all of them have been published. Uh, and that, you know, there's also the different issues with the, uh, you have tetraploids, you have triploids, and hexaploids and pinaploids. So even within one species, they're, they're different sizes. And the way they identify them now is they can take the rhizome, we'll, we'll cut it open to see what color it is. And a lot of times the leaves will have a, a red stripe. So the size of the leaf, the size of the red stripe, the color of the red stripe, all these features that normally aren't used to identify a plant have to be known to get a correct ID. So a lot of times it's not one that's in cultivation. I don't even try to give it ID because I, you know, I don't know. But these, um, what you, the way you can tell if it's a, a polyploid in this group, medicinal and edible, is the rhizomes will branch and they have fingers. When you dig up the clump, you have like one top shape rhizome and then all these little fingers that come off that you can break up and you can have tons of plants from it. The wild species don't do that. They just have like, you know, one old rhizome and then they make one or two from that and clump, but they don't have the, the branches. So you can take out one of the Rhizomes at a time, and the rest of us stay there. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even answer your question. As far as harvesting, for, like turmeric, you can grow here. Again, it's not really the most attractive of the group, but they store dry, fine <coughs> in the winter. So, what I usually recommend that, and also your edible ginger, is to have a couple of clumps and take one harvest at the end of the season, and then just put a little bit back. The next year you harvest from the next one. But you can keep the rhizomes dry indoors for months and months and months, even without refrigeration. And if you want to get it longer, you can refrigerate it. Um, yeah, very easy to do. And I think those are actually better to wait till the end of the season because, as far as like the nutrient, you know, the taste and all is better at the end. And uh, edible ginger, like the when you buy in the supermarket, you can also grow here. But that, you know, same thing. Have one clump that you don't touch for a year. Harvest from the other one, and then just go back and forth. What does the, if you buy the stuff in the grocery store and plant it, what does the flower look like? Uh, it's, Come the up. last slide's on here. Okay. Um, and again, it's not really attractive, okay. but they, they do grow here, and it's fine. So that's, you know, if you're growing it for the spice, then it's a great <laughs> plant. If you're going for ornamental, then you might be a little disappointed. But um, look at that, it's just, it's just green and small. This is a relatively new introduction. Um, again, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the name should be. Uh, so we say curcuma rubescens, but the trade name, um, the most common trade name for this is scarlet fever. It goes by red giant and a couple other names, but it's a spring bloomer, blooms from the ground first, but it's a great landscape plant. It, all the stem is solid red, uh, very showy. And the way I grow these when I have a big clump is to sort of cut the lower leaves so all the stems are displayed, but you know it's a great landscape plant. Uh, and for you that do cut flowers, the curcumas are really good to use as cut foliage. And I don't rush out and I do it right away. If you try to like, display them, like, you cut them the night before, let them soak up some water, so they're really lush. But the last several days in bases and gives you a nice background. This is one um, that kind of took the ginger world. I spawned several years ago. It's called tulip ginger, native to Thailand. Um, became basically how the, the ginger market kind of moved in Thailand. This is uh, a really good cut flower, and a very easy plant for them to grow. Um, 
they're in the wild, they usually have really small, smaller blooms, but someone found a really nice clone of a big, like lotus shaped bloom. And that basically started a whole market over there. So they started producing these by the thousands and by the millions. The Dutch have gotten involved, they import them and resell them. The Japanese have bought in, you know, tons of them. You see it everywhere. It's a beautiful plant. The only problem in our area is if you grow it, it has to be full, full sun. And people don't really get used to that with gingers. We always, most of them we had in shade or partial shade, we try to protect it from full sun. When you see these growing in the fields there, it looks like a tulip field in Holland. There's rows in the full sun, no protection whatsoever. Beautiful, blooming like crazy. And because they've done so well with that, uh, the universities there and several people in private groups are all hybridizing these different species and trying to get as many different hybrids as you can. So there's a, a huge influx of new material. Some of them do great in our climate and some won't come back. It's, there's no way to predict until you try one to know which ones will do well. And I'll show you a slide of one of the hybrids that they've developed that does actually do really well here. Um, I may have that in my yard because I just, you know, went to the big box store one day and I said, oh, you look cute and I want you as a flower. So I stuck him in the ground and it comes back every year. So, but it's really in partial shade. So do you think, do you think if I should take a portion of that and just put it in the full sun and see if it would you be better? You could definitely try that. I mean, if it's coming back for you and it's actually getting it fuller, it's happy. The problem is when they were selling the rhizomes of these, you know, they have storage tubers. So they're basically set for the next year. They come up and bloom immediately. Now mine's come up for the last three years. Right. So and um, but the the problem that you know that I kind of see is the fact that our our full my full sun I think everybody's full sun is just so um, I mean it's horrible you know when you're 104 <laughs> degrees basically yeah. and cooking I just the, the the flower and the leaf looks so delicate I, I just am thinking that truly yeah, our you'd full be sun. Both thing is in full sun you need the water and um, they do need very good drainage. Also. Oh, okay, so like full sun with drainage. Right, and but then frequent water is while they're growing. Right, okay. Which is kind of, you know, again, it's not the easiest thing it's to do. It's kind of an oxymoron, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. But um, I have started to find some hybrids of this that, you know, have the same look, but that do better here. And there's some of the species they've crossed with are actually more shade tolerant plants. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the ones, you, you can't tell until you try them, but there's some that have, you know, actually come back great every year and get really full. This is another one that started coming out at the same time. It's, uh, it's curcuma petiolata. It's been sold. Uh, also, it's curcuma cordata. Really nice, short foliage. It's about two feet tall. It spreads out and has a big, beautiful bloom in the center. Uh, it can be anything from dark purple to pure white, uh, every shade in between. And like really long blooms or really short, there's a lot of um, diversity in them. It's getting a little harder to find because a lot of these gingers, uh, district culture labs are producing dozens of species for a while. And people were importing a lot of different ones also. And then the, the labs have kind of cut back tremendously on what they produce. So the wholesalers that, that do the box stores and everything don't have as much supply as they used to. So a lot of things are a little harder to find these days. This is a, a really nice little plant. Um, it's, Basically the same thing as your hidden ginger, slightly different variety, but it's variegated. Um, it's what's called emperor. So uh, you can see on top, you have nice white striped leaves. Um, I introduced this to the U.S. several years ago. Um, it's one of the lucky plants in Thailand. There's a lot of different gingers that have basically a cultural use there. They're for good luck or different kinds of good luck. Um, so it's been growing in Thailand for a long time, but no one outside of the area knew about it. So that's been spread around, and then now I'll show you, I think it's, uh, this is one that used to be very easy to get, um, and now it's almost impossible. This is Curcuma rhabdota. Uh, candy cane is the trade name. Great little shade plant, a filtered sun, stays very low, but again, the bloom is held up above the foliage. And if you try to order these out of Thailand now, they always send you a hybrid or something else. Like, they won't send you this. Um, so I've done now, I've actually got some different varieties that are pure and just propagating, but it takes a while to, to get your numbers up. But it's very variable, but always red and white. Um, beautiful little plant. This is a bunch of them grown in Thailand. Uh, 
A lot of times they don't use plastic pots, they use plastic bags, it's a lot cheaper, but it works. This is, um, I think, the first ornamental ginger that was ever patented. And as with every other one until recently, they're all basically illegal, which should not have been patented, because they lie on their patent applications. This is Curcuma Latalon, uh, which is a really nice plant. It's a, nat it's a natural hybrid that just they happen to find in the wild of uh, the tulip ginger and curcuma cordata, the petiolata, the pink one I showed you earlier. It's a chance hybrid, um, which really shouldn't have worked because the genetics really aren't that close. But um, the guy found it and realized it was really nice and started propagating it and then got a, a patent on it and said it was a man-made hybrid. And after they told everyone that they found it. Um, but again, it was the only one in the world, so you know, they're still valid. But uh, it has, so the elements of both of the parents, it blooms above the foliage, it's very visible, there's a larger bloom, and it's better suited to our climate than the tulip ginger is. And so when they open up, it's almost like a lotus on a stalk. This is a small clump. They make nice big clumps, very easy to grow. And this is one, um, I asked about earlier, this is a hybrid that no one really knows who did it or where it came from, but it's called Purple Prince. There are a few, I believe, still you know, down in the sales area. But uh, really unique foliage, it's sort of a bluish gray shine to it. Today is very low, and then you have these really bright purple and white blooms come out of the center. It's one that was in tissue culture for a long time, and now it's not in production. So if you have a chance to get one, you know, snatch it up, because probably won't find it again for a while. But there were, I think, three or four down there. All right, next. This is um, one of the first really nice big Pacuma hybrids that uh, came on the market. And a friend of mine in Thailand made this uh, called Suli Rainbow. It's um, Curcuma orantiaca across with the Cordata. Um, both of those species are very variable, so it depends on what you use for parents. You can get very, very different hybrids out of it. This one's a really bright orange with a pink purple top on it. Really striking. Um, not the fastest grower, of course, because it's really nice, but I've had that in the ground near well, St. Gabriel, which is just south of Baton Rouge, for many, many years. Um, and this guy has done some other hybrids, and now um, some other Thai growers have produced these bigger hybrids. They've been focusing on the cut flower types that have you know, long, stiff stems instead of the, the big sort of landscape plants, but now you're getting a lot more of these really colorful types. This is a really neat one. Um, I don't particularly care for green flowers. I know that's been a trend um, lately. So I assume the next thing in that line will be invisible flowers, because that's useful as a green flower. But when this first came up, it was supposed to be a candy cane. And um, it obviously wasn't, so I was kind of disappointed that they had bought a bunch of these. And very little color when it first comes out. And then as it opens up, the red striping comes in, and there's a big, huge hole deal with this really attractive blue flower. And it's been very reliable. It's come back bigger every year. It lasts forever. It's a great cut flower. And it's you know, one of my favorite hybrids after I like, cursed it when it first came up. <laughs> but uh, I've had it in a partial shade bed, and I've never touched it. And it's actually one of the best hybrids. It's also the only complex curcuma hybrid in the world right now. Because most of these hybrids they made in Thailand and elsewhere, once you make that first cross, it's sterile. So you can't keep breeding and getting more varieties. You're stuck with what you have. Uh, one of the universities is, is working on new products. And I'll develop this basically with some lab help. Uh, I believe it's a tetraploid. But, so they had to do some manipulation to make it work. But it's a, a really nice one. It was registered as hybrid DT585 which, as you know, is not really a good trade name. Um, it's been renamed by people as a Zebra Chaco Top, which is almost as bad, but these people can say that. It has some other trade names, um, but again, a really nice one. There I think four or five down there also. Now, this is, uh, we're getting to some of the wild types. Um, this is one I have a few seedlings of. It's Curcuma Ikumata. It's from um, Chiang Mai area of Thailand up in the northwest. Um, it comes in every color combination you can imagine. Really attractive foliage. It's bloom basically on the ground level, but they're very visible.
visible. Uh, the flowers can be white, yellow, pink, purple, red, and they always have a yellow stripe. The uh, racks can be white, pink, purple, red, yellow, everything you can imagine. Uh, it's, it's never really been in the trade, so I'm trying to get you know, mine going. Um, and I'll be going to that area next month, so I'm hoping to, to find some new varieties too. But this is one variety, and this is the same species, just totally different. Out of the I could go on those for another five hours and still not cover <laughs> everything. So many. Uh, we're going to get to Glava, which are your dancing girl gingers. Um, your what? Dancing girl or dancing lady gingers. Basically, because the flower in theory is supposed to look like a, a dancing girl. Um, <laughs> very intricate, delicate little flowers. Um, usually very pretty racks in the inflorescence. These are uh, strictly shade plants. Um, there's several that we can grow in this area. This is a uh, Glavulifera, or Purple Globe. Uh, it's been in the U.S. for a very long time. Uh, this one and the Yellow Dancing Girl Ginger, which most of you are quite familiar with. Um, most, the most widespread and easiest to grow. And one feature you can't really see on here, um, a lot of Glavos will make bubbles, which are little propagules that on these lower bracts, the little round ball, little white ball will develop and in the season will drop off. And it basically functions as a seed. Um, it can get to the point if you don't control it that you'll have thousands of them. They're not that hard to get rid of. Um, usually though the species that make the bubbles aren't the best ones. The ones that you really want to make tons of won't do it for you. But we're working on that. Next, this is a uh, a new one that finally got a name is uh, Glava Sherwittiana. Uh, White Dragon is the trade name for it. Uh, beautiful, long inflorescence, great cut flower. Uh, all these pendant types, um, a lot of times they get called Glava Venetii, which is the mild nation girl ginger. That was the one that's been in the U.S. for <coughs> decades. It's a great plant, but because they're similar, people just kind of assume they're all the same thing and not realizing they're different species. Uh, this one finally got published like, two years ago. It's been in the trade probably for 20 years. It's been known about for that long. It just took that long to get someone to actually work on it. But it's cut flowers. These last up to a month with no damage whatsoever in a vase. Now, on the plant in the ground, they'll last even longer than that. And they do spread, so you do have you know, a very long season. Uh, this is the one that most of you have probably seen. It's Baba um, Schomburgii, or Yellow Dancing Girl Ginger. Here you can see the bulbs a lot uh, more easily. You know, one long stem may have 20 to 30 on there, and every one of them will probably sprout in the next season. A very easy plant. It's a great little cut flower. It's not as showy as the other ones, but um, now this we get to the really nice one. This is Baba Venetii. This is the, the true species. It was thought to be extinct in the wild for years and years, um, and since then it has been rediscovered in different areas. And there have been different varieties. And there's a, a guy I'm trying to meet in this next trip to Thailand that has probably more natural varieties than anyone else in the world, from almost dark black to bright red, um, really different, different neat varieties. You can't really tell in this photo, but what distinguishes this from the other species is the leaf basically makes a heart shape where it connects to the stem. Uh, it's the only one that does that. Um, now, they hang down, right? Right. They, 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 and there are some that are like in a red bloom, um, but most of the globules are in it. Or they kind of bunch up, stick out sideways. This is one that was also called an AI, which is not. This is a new species that is still waiting to be published. In the trade, it's called Lavender Dragon. Um, it's a different look to it, but it's got huge, huge blooms. Um, it's much larger than an AI. Again, very hardy, very easy to grow here. Another great cut flower. And this is one of the rare uh, lavas. This one's not very easy to grow anywhere. This is lava uh, substragosa. But it comes in different silver patterns. It can be all silver, silver stripes, silver squares. Uh, very low growing, like one of the fuzziest plants you can ever touch. But very difficult to grow. But there are a lot of new lavas coming out that have uh, pattern foliage, which is kind of a rare feature. Usually like a silver stripe down the middle or silver margins. Really attractive foliage plants as well. We'll try to work with some of those in. 
This is one, um, actually, this photo was taken three days ago. Uh, this is an unknown, probably new species. It's a long, pendant, beautiful white bloom, but it makes bubbles, which you want to propagate. That's wonderful because like one stem will give you 20 to 30 plants without having to break it up. Um, it bloomed last year the first time and it didn't make any bubbles because it was too late in the season. But now it's doing great. Um, so I just happened to notice a, a friend's uh, his Facebook photos. He had it in a big group shot. And I saw one little bubble. It looked like something else. It looked like a white dragon at first. And I asked him about it. So yeah, it makes them like, OK, send some of that this way. <laughs> they sent four little bubbles, three of which were like dried up beyond belief. The fourth one I thought there was no way it's going to sprout. But I put it in a pot, and it sprouted. And that little thing actually turned into that. How tall did it get? Um, right now it's a little over a foot tall. It'll probably be about a foot and a half tall. So is the, is the flower the same size as the white dragon or is it more on the scale? A little scale? bit shorter, but it's, uh, so it's a little fairly long. It's going to be, I think my full size will probably be seven inches long. It's really nice though. And as the clump gets bigger, the blooms tend to get bigger. A lot of gingers just have enough energy to do it. Is this a shade plant? Yes, all, all the glabulous are shaded. Um, now we're going to get to the butterfly gingers, which have been probably really the first gingers grown in the U.S. And the first ones were introduced probably over 100 years ago. Um, for southern gardeners, this is probably the easiest of the gingers to grow. Sometimes too easy, um, depending on the variety. This is a uh, Deacon Cassinium. There are lots of different varieties of this. This is one called Disney. It's a dwarf. Got very compact foliage, um, very narrow leaves, and a nice sort of bluish gray tint to it. A uh, bright spike of orange. And the color on this is not um, doesn't really do it justice. But um, very easy plant. I think there were some down there. I'm not totally sure. Um, but the butterfly gingers are actually, they're in the wild, most of them are evergreen. But they grow at fairly high altitudes, so they're used to getting lots of cold weather. They can take freezes. They will go dormant with a freeze, but um, it's kind of a good plant for us because the cold doesn't bother them. It may freeze them back, but as soon as it gets warm, they're the first thing to sprout. Whereas your other gingers, like the curcumas and your glabas and your peacock gingers, they come from monsoonal climates. They have a very pronounced dry season, bone dry for months, and then it, all of a sudden it gets very hot hotter than our summers. That makes the ground heat up, which stimulates the plants to sprout, then the rain. <coughs> so those plants never see cold, but because they're used to being dormant, you know, they can handle our weather usually. But these are different. They don't go dormant in a while usually, but they're used to seeing like freezes and snow sometimes. <coughs> so they're very adaptable. Now, this is one I'm sure everyone has seen. This is your Deacon coronarium, your white butterfly ginger. Um, grown all over the world, invasive in many parts of the world, but um, beautiful scent, very easy to grow, it's bulletproof, it's a, you know, a handy down plant all throughout the south. This is a uh, flybescence, which is uh, usually a little more yellow than that, it's a yellow butterfly ginger. Uh, really nice, large, waxy foliage. Uh, this particular type is sterile, it, it won't make seeds, yet it's become uh, an invasive pest. Hawaii and even like uh, parts of Puerto Rico where it just spreads, the rise don't spread that much and they get broken up and they just keep growing and growing without any seed. This is another one that uh, it's one of those cruel jokes. Um, this is a Kahili ginger or Hedicium gardnerianum. For the south is actually one of the absolute slowest of the butterfly gingers. But it's one of the most beautiful. It's a uh, great fragrance. Great foliage, really elegant look to it, but really slow. In Hawaii, <coughs> in parts of Australia, it's a terrible weed. Every flower <laughs> makes like 50 seeds. They all get spread. It like takes over forest, and just, you never stop growing. But here, it's the slowest thing you can possibly get. Which you would think like something right in the middle would be great for us. But, um, beautiful again, it's a beautiful plant. Um, the, one of the best fragrances of any ginger. This is a, a new one. Um, we have one plant of that. This is Hadikium rubrum. It's a bright red flower. 
It's one of the only true reds in the, in the Hadikiums or butterfly gingers. Um, this I imported from India. Um, it took a lot of time to actually find someone that had it. Um, what's really nice about it um, is the bracts, as you can see here, are red. Which for doing hybrids, you know, all these other ones have green cones, so you have just when it's not in bloom, there's not much to look at. When you add the extra element of color and inflorescence, so even when it's done blooming, you have something to look at and clean it up with some uh, another feature. Uh, it's a great new introduction stage flow. It's done great in the yard uh, in St. Gabriel for the last <coughs> four years or so. You know, really waxy, beautiful, large red flower. This is another really nice one. It's been grown for many years. So White pincushion gingers uh, are frilly white, sometimes it's called. I think I'm thirsty for me. Really attractive foliage too. It's got a nice ripple on the leaf, a nice texture. But it makes tons and tons of small white flowers that usually bloom in a ring. And until you have a really large established pump, it tends to be one of the later bloomers. So most of your other gingers have stopped blooming for the year. Uh, early fall is will start, so it gives a lot, a lot of color at the end of the season. Uh, this is just a, a new hybrid. Um, I think it's called Clown Suit. It's just a couple examples. There's some down in the sales area, one called Luna Moth. Um, some of the hybridizers working on this um, are using the epiphytic species, which are ones that grow in trees like orchids that are, are, are dwarf, but they have really interesting flowers. They're not hardy in our area because we don't have you know, climate for it, but they will cross with like the white butterfly ginger, ones that you know do extremely well here. So some of the Hybrid offspring have these unique looks and have a dwarf size and a cold hardiness. And um, this is one of them. This the next slide. Um, again, this doesn't do it justice. This is one called uh, Tropic Bird that a guy in Florida made. It's got to be one of the most fragrant plants in the world. Um, when I first got some from him, we were driving to Miami and back, and picked two of them up, and a vehicle would, like smelled that smell was too strong. It was like so powerful. But it, the flowers will actually last four days in this, which is really rare in gingers. Um, and they'll change colors. And it's got an amazing scent, a little dwarf plant. And that's sort of how like, the new hybrids are going. A lot of the ones that have been traded for years are uh, Japanese names, uh, like Kinkaku and uh, things, Kinogi, things like that. But all these hybrids we've had for, for decades basically came from three or four species. And there are hundreds of different name varieties, and they all look the same. The flower might have a little more orange than this other one, or you know, more cream than white, but they're basically all the same genes going different slight variations. But um, which is why I, I will never identify hybrids because there's really no way to tell what they are unless it's one like this that's different parents and really unique. Um, so this is this is like a typical Dickham hybrid. They're very nice. You get lots of whites and peaches and oranges. Um, this particular one doesn't have a name, but there are probably 100 name varieties that look just like that. So it gets kind of confusing. But again, a lot of these are fragrant, very easy plants to grow in the south. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one, um, if any of you happen to go to Burma anytime soon, let me know. This is probably one of the rarest of the butterfly genders. You know, it's epiphytic, but it has this incredible red inflorescence. It's actually named after uh, Mike Bordelon, who um, works with a guy that I described it. He's from Bordelon, Louisiana, which is not that far from me, and was raised there. Uh, no one has this plant other than the Smithsonian in Washington, and they won't let anyone have any other. <laughs> for, for doing hybrids, this is the absolute best thing for someone to use. It's uh, extremely showy. They didn't know what it was at first, um, but probably the rarest. There's some other ones that I know about are trying to get and you know getting your gingers in to the US is it can be very easy or it can be impossible. It just you never know. And so there's various people trying to do stuff and sometimes you just get lucky. You just see someone's photo and say, can I ask them that? And they're happy to send you some and a lot of times it's government restrictions on stuff and the university won't let plants out. And, you, know, you never know. Or you get caught in Atlanta. <laughs> like I did with communities. Yeah. Well, I have permits, but the last time I messed up because I went to Dallas, which is not an official entry point. Uh -huh. So we had to pay for FedEx shipping to New Orleans, which no longer is an official entry point. 
even the head of the USDA kind of didn't know that when she told me to send them there. <laughs> so I have to pay FedEx to go back to Houston to do it. But then one, one person that does all the nurseries, all inspections, everything, just had to get on a list for her to look at stuff. So two extra weeks, but most of it survived. Okay, now we're going to get to um, my favorite group. This is uh, Comparia, which are better known as Peacock Gingers. Um, this is what I say. This is what you should be growing rather than hostas in the South. Um, Comparia are great. They're, almost all of them are shade plants. There's some really eyeballs that have been discovered lately that grow in full sun, but no one grows them here. They're very low growing, um, sort of clumping perennials. The, there are some all green varieties, but almost all of them have at least a few varieties, varieties that are silver or pink or striped and spotted, feather patterns, all kind of like interesting foliage. So regardless of the blooms, there's always something really nice to look at. This is one that's been in the trade as Comparia Gibertii for many, many years. It's actually a form of Angustifolia, which is basically the same thing without the white. The nice white stripe. Long, narrow leaves, it's a really good ground cover. Um, this gets you the patch. This is Comparia elegans, a variety called Shazam. <laughs> really bold. And again, like the silver is not coming out on this, but it's really bold silver. And some of these almost like someone painted the sections on it. They're so intense. Uh, this is a, a variety of Comparia pulpra, which is probably the most common species in the South. Um, this one's called Silver Spot. There are some uh, down there available. They all have uh, pretty much a lavender bloom, but the foliage patterns vary tremendously. Okay. This is, a, again, the same species, just a different pattern type. This is one called Roscoe. It's a very large leaf, getting about 12 inches long and about 8 inches wide. And we get what um, we call Asian Crocus. It's a Confairi Rotunda. It's one of the taller varieties. Um, Again, these, these plants, a lot of these have really long distribution ranges in the wild, and we're used to seeing like one variety, like say the white butterfly ginger. Every one you've seen, you know, you've seen thousands of them, they're all actually the exact same plant. Um, but when you get in the wild, you see a lot more variations and varieties, and lots of different types. But the, the patterns of these can be all silver, can be black, and red, red stripes, pink, just you know, really, really nice. This one's one of the taller ones. And we have a uh, leaf of Grandi, which is uh, probably the largest leaf of any of the Comparia. Um, there are a few down there also available. The leaf can get about this big, massive. It gets about two to three feet top, excuse me, about two feet, which is massive, massive blooms. But this one and the, the previous one are spring bloomers. The bloom, that's all you see in the spring, is just a big clump of blooms. This one's a giant. Um, all lavender bloom. The, the rotunda is a, a little orchid, white and purple. And apparently fragrant. I've never really got that low to check it out. <laughs> I don't really see any point in advertising that because no one does that. Um, it looks really strange trying to do that every day. But there's some hybrids from this coming out now that have these massive leaves. And there's one called a pink lace, which is available. It has this kind of pattern, but it's got a, a, peak, a pink hue on the leaves. Uh, again, very massive. This one was discovered originally by a collector in Florida, in uh, Northwest Thailand. And so we've known about it for years. It's been in tissue culture in the U.S. for probably 15 years. All the taxonomists that are working on these know about it, and they won't publish it. And I don't know why. Someone just published one uh, from Laos, which is probably 600 miles away from where this is found. But I'm pretty sure they're the same species. So I think it actually does have a name now, but it's about 30 letters long, and I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to bother. Uh, now I'll get another, another new one. Um, I've been working a lot on like Kemferia, getting to like, the riddle descriptions of all the species and figuring out what's what, and trying to do a lot of work because no one else is really doing it. Um, no one looks at the genus as a whole, like from the entire range, all the countries that kind of specialize in their region. And you know, some names have been published that really shouldn't have been. Um, so we get names that are duplicates, and we get names to things that, you know, that are sort of half published. They have a proposed name, they'll use it in research, but they never give a description. And there's two competing groups there, and, and they're kind of missing a lot of good points. But in 
one camp, this is Conferia Minuta, not published yet, the proposed name. The other guy has published this from Laos, and it's Adapuensis. Um, but, you know, so that name's probably going to stick once the work's really been looked at. This, this goes all the way from central Thailand into Vietnam. And none of the taxonomists actually know that because they know it's in Thailand and you know, the other one's in Laos. But all the photos I've seen from people and collectors, it, it has a huge range. Um, but very different leaves. This one is called hieroglyphics. It's a sort of long leaf with a silver flex. It, it can be round, it can have watermelon patterns. Um, solid color, solid silver. They all have this little cute uh, lavender bloom, the dark lavender, two, two spots in the center. And we get to, a, I'll throw some of my wish list items in my slideshow. This is one that I collected in Thailand. I guess the only plant that's ever been photographed. No idea what it is, but it's really nice. Um, so I always kind of keep a little album of pictures to show people. See if I can get some of these things. And this again show you how this, the patterns work. This is a Kimfei Rotunda, and we'll call it Raven, which is a real popular variety. Again, another one of the hieroglyphics. You can see how the, the patterns are shaped. Now we get to like the really, really nice ones. This is a Kimfei Elegans, which is again another very widespread species that has every kind of leaf pattern you can imagine. Um, they get confusing for people to identify because the leaves, they vary so much. They can be really small or really big. Uh, they have kind of pleated leaf, really textured leaf, or they can be really smooth. And you have ones like this that looks like someone painted white lines on. Um, this one's called Silver Elegance. Um, a friend of mine in Thailand has started producing. But they all have the same flowers. It looks like uh, the common uh, peacock ginger that we all grow. It's a little African violet kind of flower. Is that available? Uh, no, not yet. I am working on getting those. <laughs> they are available, it's not in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, this is one I did collect. This is brand new. There are a couple available. This is uh, just published a few years ago. Uh, Conferia Chepasakensis. It's from a region in, in Laos. Uh, it can have silver striped leaves. This particular variety I have is uh, it's an all silver gray leaf. Big flower, considering how small the plant is. Um, again, it was just published, I think, three years ago. So really, really interesting, those small species. Uh, this is one um, I collected last year. It's a Conferia parviflora, which again is extremely variable in the wild. There's a, a variety called Cropsi Dom, which is a medicinal and edible plant. Uh, the current use, and why it's become so popular, has been um, advertised as aphrodisiac. <laughs> and so now, like, when they're producing it there, that the value of rhizome sales went up tremendously. <laughs> so there's all these supplement products that are, are made there, and even like a, a wine made from the rhizomes. Um, that particular variety has a green leaf. Uh, it's attractive, but it's, um, it's not as showy as these. The wild types tend to have silver patterns, and brown, and red, and pink stripes. And it can be flat on the ground, it can be two feet tall. This is a, a wild variety. And this is uh, a couple of these left. This is Conferia larcinii. So, close in the last 20 years. Usually they're all green. This is the rarest uh, type, um, with red striping. Usually on, on, on these types of gingers, you don't really have stripes. You have pattern breaks. So they have like red, but this is really rare. These were um, originally found in the wild. Now we get to, um, well, it's good to have friends overseas and trying to get this. This is um, the same species as the Grandi, but it's a different wild uh, variety. And so I made a lot of friends here and there that usually I can't talk to them because they only speak Thai. So we try to use Google Translate, which is, does not work well at all. <laughs> um, somehow, like crow's feet and chicken beaks get thrown in the translation. <laughs> Somebody tells me that's really not what I'm supposed to be telling them. But, Big leaf, this leaf is about this big, wow. and massive. And there's there's some like this that have red and pink and different silver. It's, all these individuals have really nice collections and it's trying to get you know, down to propagate them. Uh, next. 
It's another um, compare with another variety, really different. Okay. Now with peacock gingers, um, this is one of a few up here, uh, Stalianthus. Um, no real trade name, unfortunately. It's uh, just recently, within the last two weeks, has been changed to a curcuma. Um, the woman that's working on curcuma is actually really good at what she's doing. Um, has basically eliminated a couple of different genera and merged them to curcuma because all the genetic work has been backing that. Um, so these are now curcuma, but it's a really cute little plant. It only gets about a foot tall. 20 plants maybe in a clump that's about three inches wide. So it doesn't run, it just makes a nice, really attractive clump. It can be grown in a fair amount of sun, but I usually grow them in, in the shade garden. Um, anybody with peacock gingers or the goblins, um, very easy to grow. It will bloom in spring, it's a little small cup with some white flowers, which is cute, but it's mainly for the foliage. And, um, it's one of the lucky plants. I'm not exactly sure what they use it for, but it's supposed to bring you good luck as well. And um, to the last group, I hope we're doing well on time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Zingerber, which the most common one that you know, I'm sure most of you have eaten, is the edible ginger, which you buy in the supermarket. Um, but they can be very beautiful plants. This is one of the, the most attractive of the foliage types. This was um, discovered and named after Mark Collins, who's a, who's a big collector in Hawaii and Thailand. Uh, a good friend of mine passed away three years ago. Um, that was his prized possession. When I first visited him, he, he showed me all the pictures and showed me all his plants. I was like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he's never really pushed anything named after him. He said, this is not leaving my farm until they publish it. Because, you know, a mutual friend of ours is going to publish it and name it after him. So no one's getting this. No one knows where it came from other than that guy. When it's published, you have whatever you want. But not to them. So then he actually ended up giving me one of the ceilings, which was really dull. So I had like the ugly duckling of the group for years. It's, very, it's cold already here, that's fine. But this one's called, uh, you know, you call it Silver Stripes, which is kind of not really that exciting name for it, but one of the most beautiful of those engine birds. Uh, next slide is the, the bloom. They did it just started, but you'll end up with like 20 these bright orange carrots coming out of the ground. Um, very attractive when all out. <coughs> Now the next two slides are Zingerber Montanum, um, and if you look online, it's often our Casuminar, our Purpureum. It's a, a big medicinal plant in Thailand um, and in, in India also. Uh, we call it chocolate pine cone, which is this is the bloom. We have some of those available, but it's a very easy plant. It's one I've had for years and years. That you know, I sold a few, but you know, I didn't really push it. And, all of a sudden, for whatever reason, like three years ago, it's become like one of the most popular plants I have. Which kind of tells you how like these cycles come and go. But um, you know, it's used basically the rhizomes are uh, the essential oils extracted, and they make a, uh, a rub for like muscle and joint pains. And it's called Pli in Thailand, P-L-A-I. I call it top of pine cone. Um, very upright, clumping foliage. It's probably the first of the ginger burst to sprout. It's the first to bloom and usually the last to go down, which is nice. And someone asked earlier, this is the beautiful edible ginger. That's all you get from it. Um, <laughs> here we get a small little cream colored flower. It's got a little bit of red. But that bloom is maybe an inch and a half tall on the stem. It's about 10 inches. The foliage is kind of ratty. <laughs> uh, it produces a lot of rhizomes, so if you want to cook with it, it's a great plant to grow. The shampoo ginger, another ginger bruce or um, you know, Really nice, arching foliage, easy to grow here. Starts out with a green cone, sometimes called pine cone ginger. Uh, they call it shampoo ginger because if you squeeze that, it's got a really thick, fragrant juice, which is always says it's called alapui in Hawaii, and they use it for shampoo, which is not really true. But, um, <laughs> They do use it, but uh, it's, it's escaped in Hawaii years ago, and it goes through all the forest. Um, like Paul Mitchell products and all used to actually, they, they buy the juice and mix it in with their shampoo products. They didn't really do anything, but you know, it's herbal and everything. Um, because it's hard to get that. I, I just want to, um, I harvest mine, and I triple strain it, all the gel from it, 
and I mix it half and half with my regular shampoo, and I find that the shampoo rinses out fast, or whatever soap you put in there. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that because I imagine it acts like a surfactant. No. But they were buying, like years ago, they would buy from those local farmers who would head in and go harvest some and you know, extract it. But that gets expensive. So now, if you look at the ingredient list, they use fragrance of the white butterfly ginger and they're calling that al <laughs> uh, So, all these lies and commercialism, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, very, again, a great plant, great cut flower. When it's done blooming, as it's aging, it starts to turn red. When it's done blooming, it turns sour red, and it will last on the stem for months. Um, great cut flower. I think I had bad one go look when I wrote the name of it. But um, now it's happening the last week or so, now I'm getting shoots of the stem coming up from where, where the cone is. Should I trim something at some point? Or should uh, so you're having plants come out of here? No, right below the cone, <coughs> a shoot of a stem is coming up from where it's on all of them. That probably is not the same thing. There are some gingers that will do that. Okay. Usually not the gingers, though. Um, well, but the, my, the one that I do have, should I cut those or trim those? Or um, I do them? You, you know, if you let them grow, you probably cut them if you plant them and grow with that. Or the spiral bring gingers will do that sometimes, especially if they get damaged. Because um, you can grow them from cuttings very easily. Um, but if like, the, the bloom gets damaged, then it will start sprouting from the stem. And you just let them go as long as they want, and you cut them. And, you know, yeah. Or you can actually cut them yourself earlier and just cut them on it. And what um, shade group should this be going on? Um, it's that's the medium sun. Um, most of your gingers, if you have like a like areas like this where it's patchy sun, filtered light, almost everything can take that. There are only a few things that have to have full sun, and there are of course some groups that really want just pure shade. But the, that area with the filtered patches where they get some sunlight. And Moves, that's perfect for so many different things. So one more slide, the last inch group. This is one that uh, unfortunately is not in production anymore, but you know, we're trying to get it back going. Cingerbread neglectum, emerald pagoda, I believe. Probably really waxy, uh, dark, dark, fluorescent red stripe wraps, really elegant. Um, it's actually not that hard to grow, great cut flower. But, you know, it's the closest thing we can grow. In the tropics, they have what they call beehive ginger, which is uh, really tall, massive blooms, yellow and orange, um, good cut flowers. But again, you can grow them here for a year or two, and it's get smaller and smaller. And they'll never end. This has the same look, the same open bracts and all.